human milk or breast milk, um, whatever you use, is, is basically the best choice that nature designed for, for early life. Uh, so let's be clear on that. And it's a sole source of nutrition. Babies, when they're born, they only drink human milk. That's all. Now, when we say, uh, how do we connect and how do we know the composition? Well, over years, we have been able through the analytical methods to determine from macro composition to very uh, detailed nutrient composition. So, so we, we know now much more about breast milk than we knew before. Now, why is it difficult? Well, it's not always easy to get the right breast milk sample because depending on when the breast milk is taken, colostrum or mature milk, that's already determining the composition. Then whether you take the breast milk when the baby starts to drink or when he finishes to drink, that may already influence also the composition. And then the third component is that whenever you live, your diet will be slightly different. What you eat and what your neighbor eats may be different, but also when you go from uh, Europe to Asia, there may be different dietary choices. So the breast milk composition varies a lot and now for some nutrients it varies more for others it varies little one nutrient for which breast milk composition doesn't vary a lot is iron breast milk is always very low in iron when you take the fat composition the fat composition varies a lot between early and late uh, lactation between early and late feeding and also between where you live and what you eat now if you ask me last, uh, where have the data on the composition of breast milk tremendously evolved over time? I think lipid composition is one, and we talk about ARA today, so it's a long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid. The other, which is even more recent, is the human milk oligosaccharide composition of breast milk. That is really a more 10 years ago started to analyze and now we have a pretty good understanding of what is the human milk oligosaccharide composition. But that's again another discussion. ARA is, is uh, one of the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids and the two long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids that are rather high in, in, in breast milk and that is arachidonic acid it's a 20 carbon with four double bonds, so four times unsaturated. And the other one is docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, a 22 carbons and six unsaturated double bonds. Both are rather high in breast milk, but ARA is more abundant in breast milk as compared to DHA in general. Now, why are they important? ARA as well as DHA occur in cellular membranes and are also pretty abundant in the brain. Now, if we say the brain, during the first thousand days, the brain accumulates dramatic in volume and size. So from when the fetus starts to grow to when we are at about two years of age, the brain has more than 60 percent of its volume. So that means that nutrition plays a tremendous role. Taking the fact that ARA is pretty high in the brain and that the brain grows so fast, it is clear that ARA becomes an important component of breast milk and of infant nutrition. The level of ARA in breast milk depends on the diet of the mother. When the, the diet of the mother is rich in the precursor of ARA, linoleic acid, or rich in ARA itself, the breast milk will be higher in ARA. Now, how do you define what is the optimal level of ARA in breast milk? Well, you analyze breast milk globally and you consider that the reference most adequate level will be the one that you see in most mother's milk or breast milk. The level we know now that is most occurring for ARA is 0.64% of total fatty acids. If you take it as the reference, then you will also try to implement that in breast milk substitutes. 
for mothers that cannot or decide not to breastfeed. And then you need to study these breast milk substitutes with those levels and see whether that really develops or generates a similar outcome to that that is observed for breast milk babies. The functions of ARA uh, are not so widely documented as the ones of DHA because DHA is a 22 carbon, ARA is a 20 carbon. So in order to synthesize DHA, you need to have one additional step. And for that reason, DHA is a little bit more lacking uh, in, in, in the, the diet in general as ARA. And that's a, a simplification of the story. Huh? But most studies that have been done are studies that are with a combination of DHA and ARA. And when we say the studies that are to be done, uh, it might be that we need to do studies with ARA only. But as breast milk always contains DHA and ARA, it is ethically not very correct to do a study with only ARA. Neither would it be correct to do a study with only DHA. So clearly the two being present in breast milk together in all breast milk requires that we should always combine the two. So the ratio of ARA and DHA is important. Why? Because both use the same metabolic pathway to be synthesized from the precursors. And if you don't have necessarily an adequate ratio between the two precursors and or of the two final um, LC PUFAs, in this case ARA and DHA, in the diet of the baby, you may not have an optimal outcome similar to that of breastfed babies. Let's not forget all breastfed babies have DHA and ARA and the ratio is usually uh, among 2 to 1 to, to 1 to 1. So clearly uh, the ratio is important to, to assure a good development of brain function. Do we have a lot of data from clinical studies that show that if you don't have the right ratio, uh, you may have different outcomes? There are not so many studies, but there are some that have studied the effect of more DHA as ARA. And, and these are the famous diamond trials that have been conducted in the US, where you, you see that when you start to have more DHA than ARA, you may observe some brain functions that divert more from that what you see in breastfed babies. Whether that's right or wrong, we don't know. But if we say that breastfed babies are the standard reference, then you want to be as close as possible to the outcomes of breastfed babies. And in that case, a ratio of one to one to two to one is most ideal. I would say one to one, uh, one to two to 1.5 to one is the best ratio that we think we should achieve. DSM is a purpose-led company and we want to offer the best nutritional solutions for all the target populations we, we serve. And in this particular case, when we talk about infants, we talk about the mother from pregnancy till lactation and to the baby. So for the pregnant mother, we have a number of nutrients we can offer uh, that either can be incorporated in supplements or in fortified food that help the growth and the development of the fetus optimally. I'll give an example, folic acid is one. Folic acid is one. No. Second, the lactating mother. Mother's breast milk, or breast milk as such, is going to depend on the mother's diet. In order to make sure that the mother's diet is optimal, quite often you need to supplement with some nutrients. We have great solutions to achieve that. And finally, it is for the infant. When the infant cannot get breast milk, you need to have an alternative, a breast milk substitute or infant formula. For those who manufacture those infant formulas, we have a number of nutrients that can be added in order to mimic as close as possible breast milk. An example is ARA. ARA is in breast milk. We offer a nutrient, ARA, in a form that can be added to infant formulas. Most recently, we have acquired Glycon, who is a manufacturer of human milk oligosaccharides, which also can be added into infant formulas in order to mimic closely breast milk. This is the way how DSM 
wants to offer the best solutions for all and be purpose-led.